Pray with me. Dear Jesus, as we stop now to pay attention more closely to you, we want you to know how much we love you. We long to sit at your feet and learn from you and be loved by you. Show us your way and empower us by the Holy Spirit to follow that way in the world. Amen. Good morning. My name is Carrie Schuliger, and I am grateful. I married that name. It's still hard to say. <laughs> Carrie Schuliger, and I am grateful for the invitation to worship with you this morning. It's a joy to be back and see some familiar faces. For those I have not yet met, I live in North Vancouver and spend most of my days sitting with people in the practice of spiritual direction. A tiny bit more about me. I am married to my best friend, Jeff, with that weird last name. <laughs> I'm delighted by the cucumbers in my garden this month, and I'm so grateful that I am eternal because I will someday learn to dance. I am praying that Jesus will speak to you through this text and through my reflections. When Alistair asked me to preach on this text, the Mary Martha passage, did he know that I'm an older sister that could be described as bossy? <laughs> Does he know that I am distracted by many things and that either of my two younger sisters, Wendy or Maury, could be held up as illustrations of what better discipleship looks like? Oof. But if they heard me, it's a little bit of makeup, you know, for the older sister meanie pants. Um, <laughs> this passage, though, brings a high-level invitation for me and perhaps for you. The good news of our scripture passage today is there is hope for even bossy, distracted big sisters. Jesus sees us when we are overwhelmed and anxious and even self-righteous. And he invites us to himself to calm that inner storm. It is better if we go to him. Thank you, Jennifer, for reading the scripture. I want to read it one more time so that you can hear it again in this frame. You can listen again or follow along. Luke 10, verses 38 to 42. As Jesus and his disciples were on the way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken from her. Last week, Alistair unpacked the parable of the Good Samaritan. The story of Mary and Martha and the parable of the Good Samaritan are linked. They are companion texts. They're held together by the greatest commandments, loving God and loving neighbor. I was a teacher before I was a spiritual director, and one thing I know for sure is that you never give a negative example to a novice. In any learning environment, negative examples given too early will only cause confusion and slow the process. If I take a sailing lesson and my teacher begins by showing me all the ways not to rig the boat and tie the ropes, I'm off to a rocky start. But if I'm an intermediate sailor and have a solid foundation, the instructor might show me a negative example to help nuance my craft. Jesus in this passage is speaking to intermediates. The teacher of the law and Martha could see this as a compliment of sorts. It would seem that they would, both be on, that they would both be solid on the basics of loving God and loving neighbor. But Jesus employs these negative examples to challenge them both to do better. Well, perhaps it's better said to choose the better way. So to briefly review, the overarching question that holds these two texts together is voiced by the Jewish expert, who asked Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus answers with a question. Jesus asks the teacher of the law how he reads the scripture on this point, 
And the law expert answers rightly by summarizing the law and the prophets. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as you love yourself. Love God and love neighbor. The essentials. Jesus says, you got it. Do this and you will live. But the Torah expert is not quite satisfied and asks Jesus, who is my neighbor? Hoping to justify himself, Jesus replies with the first negative example in this section. You know it well. Two holy men fail, and a Samaritan is the merciful hero. Instead of feeling justified, the theological expert and the crowd are left with the choice to dismiss this unsettling teaching, or perhaps they have ears to hear and are captivated and wonder if they are even capable of leveling up their loving neighbor game. The next negative example comes in today's text. Jesus' conversation with Martha speaks to the question that the teacher of the law didn't ask. The expert skipped over a clarifying question about how well he loved God. The lawyer might have believed that he had that part of the commandments down. But Luke doesn't let the readers down. And in the story of the discipleship of Mary and Martha, Jesus uses another negative example to take us to the next level of understanding what loving God means. Just to summarize, Jesus is revealing what we must do to inherit eternal life by exploding our understanding of loving God and loving neighbor with these memorable negative examples. In our passage this morning, Jesus not only shows us what loving God looks like, but he is honoring and empowering women again. Look at that. It is not the first time he dignifies a woman with an engaging conversation, nor will it be a last in the gospel narratives. But this particular story frees women to love Jesus and be full card-carrying disciples. To name discipleship for women as an essential, not an extra or add-on, when the domestic work is done kind of reward, but a necessary fulfillment of the command to love God to sit, to learn, to worship God as core and central to this life is amazing. Jesus is inviting women to draw from their inheritance of eternal life now. And I'll step aside and say that Jesus is ahead of his time in doing this, in giving all people the possibility of recognizing them themselves in the story when you see that the main characters are Samaritans and women, Jesus is doing something expansive. Luke's whole gospel emphasizes a kingdom whose, king, whose king's arms are open wide. Luke makes sure that the reader sees the generous love and welcome of the poor and the sick and the outsider. And as Jesus gathers those who will listen and enter his life, his very life, life with a capital L, he will show them how to love him and love like him. So if the accomplished theologian lawyer is paying attention, there's room for him. We kind of expect that. Jesus wouldn't challenge him if he didn't think he were up to it, though. And when a Samaritan man of means hears Jesus' parable, he still might doubt his pedigree, but there might just be room for him, too, in this kingdom. And for the anxious, angry woman, there's not only room for her, but there's a better way on the way. Jesus' arms are still open wide. All are invited to receive this gift of eternal life. Even me, a bossy big sister, even you. And if you haven't entered this life of love and mercy and you're intrigued, take a bold step and ask someone about it today. Okay, now to our story. We know that Mary and Martha were both disciples of Jesus. They both sat at the feet of Jesus. That was one way to describe what a disciple did. They both were devoted followers of Jesus, and along with Lazarus, their brother, are considered close friends. This real interaction with Jesus speaks to the loving God part of the greatest commandments, with revelation and an invitation. Unfortunately for Martha, I see similarities between the Levite, 
and the priest in this scene. They are all busy with the work of God, working for God while missing God himself. All three are meeting the cultural and religious expectations of their day. But they all fail to love God and love their neighbor. Their lived theology gets them in the vicinity of the door to eternal life, but not through it. Martha likely has gone through that door and known the love of Jesus, but today in our story, she has fallen back into an old pattern. She's been pulled away from the person at the center of her home, is distracted and anxious about the work, and is even angry about doing it alone. The beautiful thing about Martha's relationship with Jesus is that she trusts him enough to be vulnerable, to let him know that she's peeved. She's not pretending. She's not suffering in silence. She's not putting on a good face. She's letting her feelings out to him. This is remarkable, I think, considering what I know of the cultural norms of that time. This points to the depth of trust she has with Jesus. So Martha is not to be pitied or mocked. She is in Jesus's inner circle, but she's suffering in this moment. She comes to him with an accusation of not caring, then tells him what to do. Yikes. This is an honest way to pray, a template of sorts. You can try it. Just start with, Lord, you don't care, and fill in the blanks, and then tell him what to do. It's not a bad start. At least you're praying. But see how Jesus responds to her, and see how Jesus responds to you. And not to worry, there's a better template for prayer coming in the very next chapter. Martha being the worst version of herself is necessary, though, for this narrative. We need the negative of Martha for contrast and clarity. We see our anxious, distracted selves in Martha, and Jesus responds to Martha by name. Martha. Martha. Let's stop there. What an amazing response. Can you imagine Jesus saying your name like that? Carrie, Carrie, Timothy, Timothy, Jesse, Jesse. What if the next time you get swept up into the whirlwind of anxiety, you imagine Jesus just repeating your name? I might try it as my new breath prayer. But Jesus doesn't stop there. He says, Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed. Indeed, only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken from her. There is a lot going on here. Jesus sees that she is worried and upset about many things. He knows what's going on in her thoughts and heart, that inner storm. He sees, he knows. Again, let's pause here, that the creator of the universe knows what you're worried about. He sees and knows before you even ever come to him. Jesus goes on to explain a few things that are needed. He says, actually, only one. <coughs> what, Jesus? There's so much to do, so many things to attend to. We are humans. We need so many things, and we need help doing all the things. Martha's inner storm is keeping her from loving God. This God sitting in her home is the storm calmer. And he is inviting her to do the one essential thing. Stop and love the Lord her God. This is Jesus discipling Martha. She has a choice to make. Does she allow herself to be pulled back into Jesus' orbit or is she pulled away? We don't know, but I hope she collapsed at his feet at that very moment, and Jesus' love calmed her storm. I don't know if she needed a minute to cool off and think about what Jesus said, but I hope she made the better choice and came back to love God with all her heart, soul, mind, and strength. And I hope that she received back more than what she gave. I hope she received the gift of Jesus' generous hospitality. Another link between the parable of the Good Samaritan and the story of Mary and Martha. 
can be seen through the lens of hospitality. God's hospitality is revealed in the generosity of the Samaritan, and Jesus' hospitality is seen in his invitation to Martha. In the parable of the Good Samaritan, the priest and the Levite are both busy or distracted with the work of ministry, and their hearts are closed to the one who desperately needs attention. The Samaritan man gets to be the Christ figure who at great cost rescues the broken man, heals his wounds, and provides for all his needs. That's hospitality. Similarly, Martha is pulled away by many things and fails to attend to the person of Jesus. Her agenda, based on baked-in cultural ex expectations or her own high standards of housekeeping, takes priority over being with her close friend, Jesus. Being a disciple of Jesus means prioritizing presence over performance. This is the golden rule of hospitality. Loving Jesus in this new way will mean that Martha will do the one essential thing, to listen to the words of Jesus and receive and be transformed by his love. But she'll have to stop to do that. So first, we receive the generous hospitality of God. Then we can offer it to others in like manner. And Jesus is the ultimate host. He joyfully anticipates our arrival, is delighted by our presence no matter what state we arrive in. He opens his arms to us, invites us to come and dwell with him, and offers us the gift of his full attention. We arrive hungry, and he prepares a feast. We arrive thirsty, and we are given living water. You know this. We lament. We complain. He listens. He loves. We laugh. We cry. We are accepted. We are seen. We are known. We worship. We listen. We rest. All our needs are attended to. This is God's hospitality. Now, God flips the script a bit when we come to him and live out the first part of the commandments, loving God. Because the secret is that we are the ones who are loved. This reversal is what is happening with Martha. Martha is the host. Bethany is her hometown, and this is her house. She invited Jesus to come. She prepared the meal and is cleaning it up. But Jesus flips it and invites her to come home to him. It's hard work to host. To make space and provision for another takes a great deal of effort. You may have had the opportunity to open your home and practice hospitality, practice hospitality this summer. And you were likely aware of moments when you were generous with your time and attention and times when you were pulled away or were angry about the disruption. We aren't naturals at this kind of God hospitality. We need to be disciples of this kingdom hospitality, which is why we're told to practice it. In our discipleship and hospitality, we learn by first receiving God's hospitality. And it's not as if Jesus doesn't have lots of things to do on his list at this moment in our story. He's beginning his journey to Jerusalem. So he's revealing the secret to hospitality. Choose love and presence, no matter how important the things are on your list. It's hard work to give your attention to the guest. It might be harder than doing the chores. But Jesus shows the way this evening with his friends. He sets aside his very important agenda and gives his full attention to loving Martha. Then he says, this is the essential thing. Does this sound familiar? Jesus comes to our hometown and makes his home in us. You know the scriptures, if we invite him. Then he waits patiently for us to give him our attention. The spirit of the living Jesus who sat in Martha's home abides in us. And we're too busy and distracted to attend to him. I don't know what pulls you away from loving and being loved by Jesus in this way. I don't know what you're worried and anxious about today. But I do know that most people are pulled out of Jesus' orbit by the worries and work of this life. But as I sit with people who make space to sit with Jesus for one hour once a month, what I witness is that when we do this one essential thing, we get love. It turns out 
that Jesus is flipping things again. When we fulfill the loving commandment, we get love. Do you hear that? Our work is to put all the other non-essential things aside and get ourselves to the center of that love. And if you need help getting there, find a friend who will go with you. Seek first the king of the kingdom. It is truly the one essential thing. Pray with me.